Brothers, we are now in this blessed month of Rabi'ul Awwal and we are coming towards the end of Rabi'ul Awwal. And this blessed and sacred month has a great attachment with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his blessed seerah, his life. In particular, we find the blessed birth of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took place in this blessed month of Rabi'ul Awwal. And also the introduction to his prophethood also took place in this blessed month of Rabi'ul Awwal. The great significant event of hijrah and migration upon which the Islamic calendar is based also took place in this blessed month of Rabi'ul Awwal. And the tragic demise of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also took place in this month of Rabi'ul Awwal. Now the greater an event, the greater the preparation. The greater an event, the greater the intro, the greater an event, the greater the publicity, the greater an event, the greater is the anticipation, the waiting and the longing. You know, we see in the media, some great news. When the news is great, we see every news channel reporting it, every newspaper, everyone's talking about it. And when we want to introduce something, months prior to it coming out, the next iPhone for example, we know everybody will know about it, they'll make sure. That every single person, even those living in the villages, who do not even have access to the media that we have, even they'll get a message to them as well. The greater the event, the greater the publicity. We find we have great events taking place throughout the world, and accordingly, people find out the publicity is according to this. The greatest event, unanimously everybody agrees, the greatest event which took place on planet Earth in this world, was the arrival and the blessed birth of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There was nothing greater than this. The coming of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam into the world, the arrival of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and accordingly, the event, the introduction, the anticipation, the longing, the preparation, the publicity Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made for this was amazing. It didn't just start at the time of his birth, or a year or two before. Or a few years before, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala began the publicity of the arrival of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam way before even the coming of Prophet Adam alayhi salam. Even before Adam alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted the world to recognize who this great man was. There is a discussion amongst the scholars in regards to which is the first creation of Allah. What did Allah create first? Some scholars have mentioned that Allah created the pen of Lawful Mahfuz first. Some say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the arsh, the throne of Allah. However, many scholars, including Allama Anwar Shah Kashmiri rahmatullahi has mentioned that the first creation Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made. And he says this is an authentic narration. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says himself, Awwalu ma khalaq Allahu nuri. The first thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made and created was the nur and the light of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Spurry unfortunately we are having to announce this is a Vauxhall Astra WF54DCU. Please uh, remove your cars obstructing and anybody else who is parked in an unsuitable manner please uh, move your cars. Jazakallah khairan. So he says that the first thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created was the nur of Nabuwa of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam thereafter the rest of the creation followed. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he created Prophet Adam alayhi salam 
Imam Jalal bin Suyuti rahmatullah alayhi has written that something amazing would happen in paradise. We all know about the story of Adam alayhi salam when he was created in paradise. Something amazing would happen in paradise which was that all the angels they would follow Prophet Adam alayhi salam and they would want to see him. They would stare at him. They'd try and see him from all angles and they'd follow him everywhere he would go. And Imam Suyuti rahmatullah has written why? The reason is because the nur of Nabuwa and this amazing light Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed it in the forehead of Prophet Adam alayhi salam. Obviously all the souls, all the people who are going to come, his children, they have been placed inside him, in his loins. So was the nur of Nabuwa of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this would become radiant and shine. And the angels in paradise would try and look at him from every angle. To the extent Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gathered all of the angels on two occasions for the master of the world sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And one was in paradise to read in the Quran when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded all of the angels us juduli Adam make sajda and prostrate to Adam alayhi salam. Now we all understand this was not a sajda of worship. We just perform salah. Sajda of ibadah can only be done to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, before our nation and our sharia, in the previous sharia you are allowed to bow down to somebody, whether it was a full prostration or half or just bowing the head, and this would be like making salam, like we have in Surah Yusuf. The father, the mother, the, the, the brothers, all of them, they bow down to Yusuf alayhi salam. We find this in Surah Yusuf. So similarly we find that the angels were commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to prostrate to Adam alayhi salam. This was out of honoring Adam alayhi salam and as a tahiyya, as a salam, as a welcome. So Imam Jalal bin Suyuti rahmatullah, a great scholar, and also one of the great scholars of Tafsir, Imam Fakhruddin Razi rahmatullah alayhi. When commenting upon this, they have said, yes, this sajda was made to Adam alayhi salam, but they say in reality what happened here, this was the nur of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Adam alayhi salam, and the angels were commanded to make sajda, meaning they were making salam and welcoming Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah says in the Quran, inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi. Verily Allah and his angels, they send salutations upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So preparation for this great event was made prior even to the coming of Adam alayhi salam. Now, this nur of Nabuwa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed it in Adam alayhi salam and generation after generation after generation, it continues to travel until it comes to the noble father of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Hazrat Abdullah radiallahu anhu. We should know this basic information, who are the parents of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and who was his immediate family members. So we know his father's name was Abdullah. Now this nur has traveled generation after generation after generation. And now this nur of Nubuwa, the nur of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has traveled all this time and is now is in the body of Abdullah radiallahu anhu from him, this seal of the Prophet, Imam of Anbiya, the best and the beloved of Allah is going to be born very soon. What happens, the historians have written that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because of this nur of Nabuwa, granted Hazrat Abdullah great beauty. And the women of Makkah would follow him around as well, just like the angels used to follow Adam alayhi salam in Jannah. They would follow him around and they would propose to him, they would entice him, they would try and seduce him. In particular, there was one woman who was knowledgeable of the previous scriptures. She was a soothsayer as well. And she tried everything she could to try and seduce him, to try and bring him closer to her. She tried everything in the book. She proposed many times, Abdullah radiallahu anhu, he would decline. Each time he would decline. To the extent she even went to his family members to try and coax them as well. That somehow try and arrange something between us. So every time he would pass by her house, it was very difficult. He had to really, really control himself because she would do all sorts of things just to try and get him to come into his house and have relation with her. He saved himself, he protected himself. Until the time came when he was engaged and married to Amina radiallahu anha, the mother of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But this woman didn't stop here. Even though she knew 
Even though she knew that Abdullah is now married, she continued to follow him. And she says, I am pleased to be your second wife. Please take me in your marriage. Take me in your marriage. And she continued to do the same thing that she used to. Until a time came, on one occasion, Abdullah anhu was walking past her house. He prepared himself from before mentally thinking, right, she's going to do all her tricks again. I need to avoid her. Surprisingly, this time, when he walked past her house, she began to cry, scream, and she ran into her home. Abdullah anhu, he became confused. Something new, this has never happened before. She never does this. She approached and he said, why did you do this today? You have never done this before. Today you have done something so strange. You've never done this before. Your behavior is different normally. What did she reply? She says, you know I am knowledgeable of the scriptures of the past. And I have read the signs of the Nabi and the Prophet who is going to come, who will be the Prophet of the end of times. And she says, you know I am a soothsayer. She says, from all the details which have been mentioned in the previous scriptures, I could see the nur and the light of that Prophet on your forehead. Because of this, I would follow you. And I wanted that beloved Prophet of Allah to come through my body. This is why I would try and entice you and bring you closer to me. But today I have realized that this nur has transferred from you to Amina bin Tawahab radiallahu anha. She is the one who gave him the first news of his wife conceiving. Abdullah goes to his wife, and it is true, she had conceived nine months after this. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was born. Nine months after this. Now upon the birth of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there were many, many amazing events that took place. And like I mentioned, the greater an event, the greater the publicity. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he comes into the world, and many, many great things have happened. Many, many great things begin to happen. We find that upon the birth of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, prior to his birth, prior to his birth, he's not even coming into the world yet. Prior to his birth, his father Abdullah passes away. So the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is coming into the world as an orphan. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to make publicity in the whole of the world, of this great human who is going to come. On the other hand, the Ummah is now placed in a trial. That this man who is going to come into the world, who is going to be the leader of mankind, he is an orphan. He is an orphan. So on one, on one hand, we need to understand how great he is. On the other hand, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made him an orphan. He comes into the world, he doesn't have a father. He doesn't have a father. And we know the incident that one day his mother, Amina bin Tawahab radiallahu anha says, that let me take you to the grave of your father. His father was buried in Medina Munawwara. She says, let me take you to the grave of your father. At least I can tell you. You may ask, that like, who is my father? Where is my father? Other children are fathers. Where is my father? She says, let me take you and show you the whereabouts of where he is buried. So they travel on one camel. Amina radiallahu anha, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, only six years old, six years old. And the maid of Abdullah who had passed away, Umm Ayman, three people only. Two ladies and one child, six years old. And they travel from Makkah to Mukarramah, they go to Medina Munawwara. Remember, between all this, it's desert. It's desert. Even now, if you were to travel by car, it takes you about, what, five hours, five and a half hours, if you go by car. So imagine going on camel, no roads in those days, going through the desert. So they go, they visit the cover of his noble father. Once they are returning from this journey, the mother, Amina bin Tawahab, radiallahu anha, she becomes ill, severely ill. And during the journey they reach a place called Abuwa. And it is upon this place that the mother of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she breathes her last and she leaves the world. Now take a moment out here. Before he came into the world, his father had passed away. Now, just think for a moment. Have you seen a six-year-old child? My most respected chef and teacher, he says 
that if you want to create spirituality in your heart, if you want to make your heart shine, if you want to remove the darkness of the heart, if you want to dispel the evil thoughts you have in your mind, if you want to become a spiritual person, if you want to create noor in your heart, then he says you do not need to go through many many spiritual exercises. It's not that difficult. He says it is sufficient for you to take out a moment and think of that six year old child, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, standing over the dead body of his mother, in the middle of the desert, when there is no one to give her bath, no one to give her ghusl, no one to give her kafan, in the heat of the desert, six year old child. Have we seen a six year old child? What is the understanding of a six year old child? And this is the trial Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put the ummah through. So he comes into the world, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is an orphan. At the tender age, tender age of six, he loses the shadow of his mother. And he returns. Now this is something to think about. Next time you see a six year old child, think. Let it take you back. You will see and you will feel your heart becoming clean. You will feel the darkness of your heart being removed. And your heart becoming illuminated. Because anybody who attaches themselves with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they will definitely prosper. And this is something we find in the lives of our previous scholars. That their life was dedicated to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Their mind was occupied with thinking of him. Why? Because they loved him. They loved him. So this is an incident which takes place when he is only six years old. Thereafter, we find the publicity Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has come into the world. We find the previous scriptures did not mention one or two details, but there were chapters describing the features of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his companions. We find that there was tremors which took place and shook the palaces of the kings to the extent Kisra, the Persian emperor, 14 towers of his palace fell down. They collapsed and he became worried and he wanted to know why and he said, you remember I saw a dream last night about Arabian horses and camels and he wanted the interpretation, we don't have time to go into the lengthy discussion of how this happened and at what length he went to get the ta'bir and the interpretation of the dream cutting it short he was given the interpretation that today the last prophet of all time has been born so he says okay if that is the case tell me there was no earthquake there was no tremor. Why did 14 towers of my palace fall down? Why did they just collapse without a tremor? He says the meaning of this is that there will be another 14 emperors, another 14 rulers in your kingdom. After this your kingdom will come to an end. There will be no more Kisra. There will be no more Persian empire. You will not remain a superpower of the world. So he becomes really happy and excited. And he thinks, okay, we've got another 14 generations. We've got another 1400 years. 14 times 100, he calculated that each ruler will rule for 100 years. Little did he know, little did he know that at the end of Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu's khilafah, all of these 14 had come to an end. Some of them only ruled for a few days, some for a few months, some for a few years. Every one of these came to an end by the end of the Khilafah of Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu and Persian Empire was taken over by the Muslims. So this was another great event which took place. And like this there were many many other events which took place on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His arrival was announced in the whole of the world. There were many many other incidents. Why was all this publicity done to signify that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has honored him? Allah has exalted him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to understand. Allah is telling you and I, I love him, so you love him as well. I honor him, so you honor him as well. And in many, many different ways. You know, we call it a seerah program. It is very, very difficult to talk about the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. With what words will we discuss? How will we mention? And how will we encompass that beautiful life in the short time that we have? 
And who has the courage? And who can make justice to the topic? It's impossible. Let us try and understand just through a few examples. The honor of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when it came to revelation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, Prophet Nuh alayhi salam, how many years did he preach for? How many years? 950 years. And besides that, he, he became a prophet at the age of 40, 950 years he preached for, and after this he lived for maybe another 50, 60 years. So he was over a thousand years old. How many times did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send him wahi and revelation? Allah sent him a special message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How many times? 50 times. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends him a special message which we call wahi and revelation 50 times. We hear Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam who is the Khalil of Allah, the friend of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent him wahi 48 times. We hear the names of Prophet Adam alayhi salam, Prophet Isa alayhi salam. These are great prophets. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent them both wahi 10 times. But when it came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent him wahi and revelation 24,000 times. Within a period of 23 years. In 23 years, sometimes in one day 10 times, 15 times. He would receive the revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you and I to know that this man is no ordinary man. This is no ordinary prophet. This is the most beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allama Manawi rahmatullah alayhi mentions amongst the many specialities of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam which Allah gave to him only and nobody else. One of them is very amazing. I came across this and I thought I'll share with you. He says one amazing speciality of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned every organ and every limb of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the Holy Quran. Allah has directly referred to every limb and organ of his in the Quran. For example, let us look at the blessed face of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah says, قَدْ نَرَى تَقَلُّبَ وَجْهِكَ فِي السَّمَا At the time when the Qibla uh, was about to change, for 16, 17 months the Muslims faced Masjid al-Aqsa for their salah. But when a time came when he knew that the Bani Israel are not going to listen, it's the end of their time of acceptance. It doesn't seem that they're going to turn to our, to, to, to our deen. They are very stubborn in what they believe. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would constantly look towards the sky. He would turn his face towards the sky, waiting for revelation. Allah liked this so much. Allah says, قَدْ نَرَى تَقَلُّبَ O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam I have seen, I have seen your face, your blessed countenance. Turning to the sky again and again, don't worry, we will change the Qibla, we will change the Qibla, Kaabatullah is now the Qibla. Allah refers to his blessed face over here, Allah mentions his blessed eyes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَمُدَّنَّ عَيْنَيْكَ O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, do not stretch your eyes towards the materialistic things that people have been given. Allah talks about his eyes, in another place Allah talks about his blessed eyes. Blessed gaze. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when mentioning the incidents of Mi'raj, it is Ma Zab al Basaru wa Ma Taha. Ma Zab al Basaru wa Ma Taha. Basar means gaze. Allah has mentioned every organ and limb of his. How much love Allah has for him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the eye never went wrong. The eye never went wrong. He saw what he saw. He saw what he saw when he went for Mi'raj. The blessed tongue of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. فَإِنَّمَا يَسْتَرْنَاهُ بِلِسَانِكَ Lisan means tongue. فَإِنَّمَا يَسْتَرْنَاهُ بِلِسَانِكَ O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We are going to make this Qur'an very easy upon your tongue. Allah subhanahu wa sallam mentions his blessed neck as well. وَلَا تَجْعَلْ يَدَكَ مَغْلُولَةً إِنَا عُنُقِكَ that do not tie your hands, do not make yourself so tight and tie your hands towards your blessed neck. Allah mentioned his blessed neck, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah goes on to mention the blessed heart of Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. نَزَلَ بِهِ الرُّوحُ الْعَمِينَ عَلَىٰ قَلْبِكَ عَلَىٰ قَلْبِكَ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the Qur'an, عَلَىٰ قَلْبِكَ Upon your blessed heart. Allah mentioned his blessed chest, أَلَمْ نَشْرَحْ لَكَ صَدْرَكَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that have we not opened up your chest for you? Have we not made it very broad and wide for you? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned his blessed back, الَّذِي أَنْقَدَ ظَهْرَكَ That which was about to break your back, الَّذِي أَنْقَدَ ظَهْرَكَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not only does he mention his organs, even his position, Allah talks about his standing. 
Allahi yaraka hina tafum. Allah says, Allah is the one who watches you when you're standing in prayer. Allah watches you. You're standing. What a qalubuka fi sajideen. Allah mentions his prostrations. Allah says, you're turning to Allah in your prostrations. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala concludes by saying that, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, فَإِنَّكَ بِأَعْجُنِنَا Allah says, perpetually, continuously, O Muhammad, I am always looking at you. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, فَإِنَّكَ بِأَعْجُنِنَا فَإِنَّكَ بِأَعْجُنِنَا You are always in front of us. Allah says, I am always looking towards you. Allah sees everybody, of course. Allah sees everybody, of course, at one time. But specific attention, Allah says, فَإِنَّكَ بِأَعْجُنِنَا this should give us an understanding how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals him, how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honors him, how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted him dignity and honor. Now the question is, how much do you and I love and honor him? This is the question. The question is, this is how much Allah honors him. How much have you and I recognized him? How much do you and I honor him? How much time have we taken out for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? We find in the lives of Sahab radiallahu anhum, they were totally different. They dedicated everything they had for the sake of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Their hearts were decorated with his love at all times. And even at the times of need, when a person forgets everybody, you remember those who are close to you. You think of a time when you are in need, when you are in trouble. When you are going through difficult times, we think of our mother, we think of our brother, we think of our father, we think of our friends. Do we ever remember Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? An nabiyyu awla bil mu'minina min anfusihim. Quran says the Prophet of Allah is closer to you than you are to yourself. Look at the incidents of Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu in the beginning of Islam. When he went and confessed his faith openly and the people of Mecca beat him beat him too so much that it was difficult to recognize him. His condition they had made so bad that it is said it was difficult to even recognize him. This is the condition, he's close to being unconscious. When he's revived, his mother is there, other family members are there. What are the first things he says? What are his first words? How is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? When he loses he loses his conscience again. And when he wakes up again, the first thing he asks, How is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? They say to him, It's because of him you have suffered. It's because of him your condition is such. But does he want to listen to this? They say, Eat something, drink something. He says, No, I will not eat. I will not drink until I do not see Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This was the love. This was how immense they were in regards to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sayyidina Abu Musa Ash'ari radiallahu anhu says that regarding his uncle Abu Amir radiallahu anhu, on one occasion Abu Amir radiallahu anhu, he was struck with an arrow. He was struck with an arrow. And he was being transported, his body was being carried. And he was breathing his last. Now imagine a person in the throes of death. You are breathing your last. Who are you going to think of? Who do you remember? What are his final words? His final words were, Please convey my salam to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and ask him to make dua for me. Do you know the final moments are not easy. A person doesn't remember everyone and anyone. A person only remembers those who are close to their heart. Close to their heart. We find the Sahabi, the enemies had captured him and they are about to hang him. Now if the Sahabi is about to be hung, there is no Muslim in the whole vicinity, he's alone. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds to him and he says, Oh Allah, you bear witness, there is nobody here. Oh Allah, you pass my salam to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam through the divine wahi and revelation. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is informed and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gives him glad tidings of paradise and he responds to his salam. These were the Sahaba Kiram radiallahu anhum. We read about Sayyidina Bilal radiallahu anhu. When he was on his deathbed, his family had gathered around. They were all crying. And they were saying, what's going to happen to us after today? You are leaving the world. How sad it is. And he says, there's nothing to worry about. Don't cry upon me. I am so excited. Tomorrow I'm going to meet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I'm the Sahaba Kiram radiallahu anhum. Even non-living things. You know, these are Sahaba. 
even non-living things. You know, we hear the incident where the Prophet wasallam would lean towards the date palm tree and give the khutbah. Uh, before the, 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 the member was, was created, before the member was made. And then there was a female companion who volunteered and said, I will construct a member for you out of wood. And after this was made, the Prophet wasallam left the date palm tree. And the authentic narration mentioned that this date palm tree would cry like a baby child. Out of separation of Rasulullah it couldn't bear it. The Prophet ﷺ descended from the pulpit and he ﷺ patted the tree just like you cut a baby and a child. Only then it became quiet. The scholars have written that if Rasulullah ﷺ hadn't done this, this tree would have continued to cry until Qiyamah or until it was existing. So even non-living things, non-living creatures, non-living things which do not have life, even those understood and recognized the greatness and the honor Allah had given to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the question is, how much have you and I honored Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? The purpose isn't to sit here and give a lengthy talk and listen to a lengthy talk. We're here for a purpose. And that is to create our bond with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To make it strong once again. How can you and I connect ourselves with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? My most beloved Shaykh, he says that, MashaAllah, we have many masajid now. We have many madaris, we have many marakis, we have many efforts of deen. Such efforts we have, alhamdulillah, throughout the world, in particular in this country, that we've never had this ever in history before. Look back in history, the amount of Islamic literature that's available, the amount of people frequenting the masajid, we've never had this before. So alhamdulillah, in all areas, people are trying. And mashallah, people are particular and concerned and alhamdulillah we are all concerned people sitting here regarding our faraid, our salah for example aren't we concerned? does anybody want to miss their fajr for example? no, it's an obligation we all set our alarm, don't we? or we don't? we do or we don't? we do okay, well inshallah we will do okay, so this is something we do to ensure that we get up and we'll set our alarm we know it's an obligation Fasting in the month of Ramadan, we make preparation, we know it's an obligation. Our parents looking after them, it's an obligation. Making the Hajj, we know it's an obligation. But he says, Alhamdulillah, in all areas we are trying to fulfill the command of Allah and the obligation. He says there is one deficiency, one shortcoming, one obligation which we haven't realized or recognized, and that is the obligation of loving Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We have fell very behind. He says, this is not something optional, it's an obligation, you have to, it's a must. The love of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam must be brimming in our hearts. And he says to do this, it's our, it's our responsibility that we should try and check ourselves, inspect yourself. He says to do this, you do not need to go to any sheikh, any alim, any scholar. You can do this yourself. Allah has given us the criteria or you can say the test in the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a thermometer, you can call it. How much love do you have for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and is it enough? We've been given this in the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given this and we should regularly check and measure. You look into your heart, I look into my heart. Let us try and understand according to this thermometer. It's very, very simple. Very, very simple. Firstly, I ask a question in the last 24 hours. In the last 24 hours, I won't say in the last so many weeks or so many months or so many years. Just the last 24 hours. Of course, we've remembered our mother, we remembered our father, we've remembered our brothers, our friends. We've thought of various people, haven't we? Yes, no? Yes, we've thought of various people. How many times have we remembered Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Being very honest, how many times? When we're reading Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Ali Muhammad, do we think of him then? How many times? It's a question. Because this is an obligation. Allah says in the Quran, Allah puts you and I to a test. And it is every one of us should take this test regularly, every single day. Inspect yourself and test yourself and see. Allah says in the Quran, Qul insana aba'ukum. It's a very simple test. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions those who are closest to you the most. 
Allah says your parents. There's eight things I'm going to mention. Count with me the eight things. Number one is the parents. Okay, bear this in mind. Memorize this because you'll need this for your test on a daily basis. Because Allah is asking you and I to take this test every single day in the Quran. We have been told to weigh this and see which way are we heading. He says, قُلْ إِنْ كَانَ آبَاؤُكُمْ Tell them, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, your parents. Parents are the closest to us, aren't they? So he says, your parents, number one. Number two, وَأَبْنَاؤُكُمْ Your children. وَأَبْنَاؤُكُمْ Your children. Number two is children. And then he says, your brothers and sisters. So you've got parents, your children, your brothers and sisters, your wives, meaning your spouse, your partner. So you've got four here. And then وَعَشِيرَتُكُمْ Your family. It could be your uncle, your auntie, your grandparents, your cousins, your extended family, those who you love. Obviously we all love our family. So he says your parents, your children, your brothers and sisters, your partner, your wife, and for the women, your husband, your family, the rest of your family. And then he goes on to say وَأَمْوَالُكُمْ Number six, your wealth. Your wealth. Whatever you possess, you don't have to be a millionaire to fall in the category of wealth. Whatever you possess, it could even be your mobile phone. How much are we attached to our phone? Okay, your wealth. Your business, your job, your occupation, your position. And the last one, your house, your dwelling, the place where you live. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, take a scale. So in your mind you need to have this scale. On one side, he says, put the love of these eight things. So your parents, your children, your brothers and sisters, your partner, and then your family, and then your wealth, and then your business or your job, and your house. And he says, on the other hand, put the love of Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and weigh it out for yourself. Measure. Make the measurement. Have we ever made this measurement? It's an obligation. It's not optional. How can I say it's an obligation? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after this, He uses such stern words which He hasn't even used for those who miss their salah. Not to say salah isn't important. Of course salah is important. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that if the love of Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not heavier and greater than these eight things, then Allah says, فَتَرَبَّصُوا حَتَّى يَأْتِيَ اللَّهُ بِأَمْرِ Then wait until the punishment of Allah will come. Today we are suffering in this world, our Shaykh mentions we are suffering in the world because of this. Because we have let go of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We have forgotten him. So every day we should do this test. We should check ourselves and try and increase ourselves. Just like we set our alarm for fajr because we are worried it's an obligation. This is also an obligation to love Rasulullah. Now I will tell you the hadith which I mentioned in the beginning. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, لا يؤمن أحدكم None of you can become a perfect believer. Your iman is not complete. حتى أكون أحب إليه Until I, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, am not more beloved to him من والده than his parents. وَوَلَدِهِ and his children. وَالنَّاسِ أَجْمَعِينَ And all the people of the world. So the love of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam should be brimming at the top. So now, we remember our loved ones. You know sometimes the thought of your loved one wakes you up from sleep. The thought of your loved one, for example, rushes you out of your house, you want to go and see them. How many times have we been woken up by the love of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? How many times has it changed our condition? Thinking about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this is something we need to understand, we need to try and develop. We find in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there was one sahabi, and the scholars of hadith have called him Al-Qa'il, Al-Ba'il, Al-Sa'il. Al-Qa'il, Al-Ba'il, Al-Sa'il. Why? Al-Qa'il means the one who made the statement. Al-Sa'il means the questioner. And Al-Ba'il means the one who urinated. So now you might ask me, who is this? We've never heard of this sahabi before. That's not his name. We don't know his name. His name is anonymous. Nobody knows what his name is. But the scholars of hadith have referred to him because of certain actions he did as Al-Qa'il, Al-Ba'il, Al-Sa'il. Al-Qa'il, the one who made the statement, he said something, what did he say? This man who was from the village, a simple person, he came into the masjid on one occasion and he lifted his hands, he made dua, Allahumma arhamni, uh, Allahumma arham alayya wa ala Muhammad, wa la tarham ma'ana abad, uh, 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 wa la tarham ma'ana ahada. Uh, he says that, oh Allah, 
Shower your mercy upon me and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and don't show your mercy to anybody else. Just upon me and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and do not include anybody else in the mercy. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he heard this, he began to smile and he said that you have really narrowed down the mercy of Allah. Allah's mercy is very vast. What are you doing? Why are you squeezing the mercy of Allah and limiting it to ourselves only? So because of this, the scholars of hadith, he was from the village, a simple person. He made this dua, he is not al-qa'il. The other name the scholars of hadith have given this same person, we don't know his name, is Al-Ba'il. Al-Ba'il means the one who urinated. One day he comes into the Masjid al-Nabawi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and in a corner, started urinating. Sahaba, they became enraged. What were you doing? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, leave him. Da'u, leave him, leave him. Let him finish. He finished, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told the Sahaba, get a bucket of water, clean it. And then he called him, and you can imagine this man must have been fearing after the reaction of the Sahaba. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a very polite manner told him that, Brother, this is the house of Allah, and the house of Allah has been constructed for salah and the zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These kind of things we don't do in the masjid. He said, I've never seen a better teacher than this ever before. The best teacher I've ever come across. And then the scholars mention he is also known as As-Sail, the questioner. What's the question he asked? He came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said, O Prophet of Allah, mata sa'a? O Prophet of Allah, when is the day of judgment? Tell me, when is the day of judgment? I want to know the exact day. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that what preparations have you made? You really seem like you're keen to meet the day of judgment. Are you ready for it? Have you made any preparation for it? He says, no, I've not made much preparation. I don't have many salah, many fast, much salah. But there is one thing, I love Allah and His Rasul. I love Allah and His Rasul. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Al-Mar'u ma'a man ahabba. Or he said, Anta ma'a man ahbabta. That a man will be with whom he loves. A man will be with whom he loves. The love of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is very powerful. The love of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam can take a person very very far. It's a duty upon us that we try and make this endeavor to increase our love for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We find that because of the love of Rasulullah, Allah has even changed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has even changed his system. We find two uncles of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They were both on two extremes. One of them loved him. One of them hated him. The one who loved him was Abu Talib. He supported him. He helped him. However, he died as a non-Muslim. He did not accept Iman and Islam. But because of his love for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, although he is in the fire of Jahannam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has told us that Allah has shown him kindness to the degree that he has the lightest punishment in Jahannam. Because of his love to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now we can imagine the people in Jahannam. Jahannam is a very difficult place. But because he showed love to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he has the lightest punishment. The hadith mentioned he is made to wear slippers without a fire because of which his brain is boiling now, as we speak as well. And he thinks that he has been given the worst punishment in Jahannam, whereas this is the lightest punishment of Jahannam. This is the lightest punishment of Jahannam. So on one side we have Abu Talib, but the love he showed to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam benefited him. Even though he was a disbeliever, imagine you and I were to show love to him. Would it not benefit us? And on the other hand, we have the enemy of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who is Abu Lahab, who showed such enmity that even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed verses of the Qur'an telling us that Abu Lahab, his wife, will burn in the fire of Jahannam and cursing him. But however, he showed love to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam upon his birth by setting his slave girl free. Because of which Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi has mentioned in his Sahih that somebody saw Abu Lahab in a dream after he died and asked him, how has Allah dealt with you? And what did he say? He says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm in Jahannam, I'm burning in the fire. But he looks forward to every Monday because every Monday I get a marginal reduction in my punishment. And he says, inni suqeetu bihadihi. He pointed towards the middle part of his finger between his thumb and his index finger. And he says, whenever I put this towards my mouth, sprinkles of water come into my mouth. And I soothe myself slightly. Why is this? Why is this such a great enemy of Islam? He's in the fire of Jahannam. 
But the love he showed to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because he set his slave girl free by pointing to her with the finger, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him benefit there as well. However, he was an enemy of Islam. He will remain in the fire of Jahannam forever. But we are Muslims, alhamdulillah. Don't we love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Don't we? Don't we honor him? So, we need to have an action plan. How can we change ourselves? How can we change ourselves? How can we better ourselves? Like I said before, the aim is not to discuss the whole of the sphere. It's impossible for us to do this. The aim is how can we attach ourselves to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and begin to study the sira. So for this, coming to an end and a conclusion for today's talk, the first thing I'm going to ask everybody here to do is, let us try to begin studying the sira of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We need to do this, we need to take some time. You know, we've read up about everybody. You know, we know everybody's status today. We know everybody's profile. But what's the profile of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Who was he? How was he? How did he conduct his life? Who were his family members? Today we know everybody in the world. If we've not recognized, we've not recognized Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the first thing I want everybody to do inshallah, including myself, we all need to start doing this. But let us try and read the biography and the seerah and learn the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is amazing, there is nothing better you can do than study the life of the most beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We'll all try and do this inshallah. And for this alhamdulillah we have prepared uh, 20 short lessons on the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, just a few pages and inshallah we'll be, you can collect this on your way out for free. We'll be distributing this inshallah. Seerah in 20 lessons. This is not the whole of the seerah, but what we've done is just snippets of the seerah into 20 basic lessons regarding his birth when he was born, his parents' names, and then what happened after that and his hijrah, and then he went to Makkah al Mukarrama, Medina, Munawwara, and passed away, and then his wife's names, his children's names, his, wife, uh, his aunties, his uncles, and a few of his features. So this, inshallah, will be given up. I request everybody, please take one of these, read it, try and memorize it. Try and memorize it, try and understand. This is very, very basic. This is somewhere we can start from. And after this, inshallah, we can try. There are many other great books of Sira. Sira al Mustafa, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a very amazing book, Sira al Mustafa. It is now available in English as well. And for those who do not understand English, mashallah, there are many books in Urdu, in Bangla, in, 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 in Hindi, in many, many different languages we find. And in English, alhamdulillah, we have many books on the Sira of Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So everybody will try and do this, inshallah. So the first thing is, we try and study and read the Sira of Rasulullah. In this we will learn who he was, how he conducted his life, what kind of a person he was, how is the events that took place in his life. And we will learn so much from there. Everything that we are facing today in the world is because we have left the seerah of Rasulullah If you come on to the seerah, we will not see any problems. We will see a solution to every problem, number one. Number two, the second thing we're going to try and do inshallah, after today, after listening to today's talk, the first one is we're going to all try and study the seerah. Yes, inshallah? Yes, number one. Number two, the second thing is we need to make abundance of recitation of Guru Sharif. Very, very important, very, very beneficial. Today we are very, very slow, very behind, and we are lacking in this area. We don't read much Guru Sharif. We don't send much salutation upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah is sending salutation upon him. Allah is telling us in the Quran. Allah doesn't perform salah, nor does he fast in the month of Ramadan, nor does he perform the hajj. But when he came to sending salutations, Allah says in the Quran, before he tells you and I, before he tells you and I, you know, you, you see people, you know, you can talk the talk, but you need to walk the walk as well. Actions speak louder than words. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself first tells us, Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi. That all people, Allah and his angels, Send salutations and durood upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. O believers, you also send salutations upon him. So Allah is giving his own example. Allah is telling us, I send salutations. Why can't you send salutations? How many salutations do we send a day upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? We know he has a right on us, okay? Yes, we know this or we don't. He does have a right on us. You know, if somebody lends us some money, for example, somebody helps us out, every time we see them, we try and be courteous of them, be mindful of them, we look out for them, we make sure that, you know, we respect them, we honor them. Well, some people don't, but generally you should. Uh, obviously we do, it's only natural. But the favors Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has upon you and I are countless. 
If we start counting them now, we won't have enough time. So many favors. Let us just mention one thing. Who doesn't know the incident of Ta'if? Who doesn't know this? Alhamdulillah, majority of the people sitting here, we must have stuck in the talim that takes place every day in our masjid or in your respective masajid. And if not, we should sit in the talim that takes place. And if not, in your local masjid, you must have been out in Jamaat for three days, for ten days, forty days, four months. And we see it sit in the talim. In the talim, we hear right in the beginning of Nikayat al Sahaba, we find the story when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went to Ta'if to call the people to Islam. Cutting the long story short, Cutting the long story short, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was pelted with stones for about three miles to the extent that his blessed flesh ripped open and from head to toe he was covered in blood. Now this is nothing small, imagine how hard would you need to hit somebody with a stone for them to start bleeding from head to toe and so much blood that his blessed sandals were clogged to his blessed feet. That's how much blood there was. And every time he'd fall down, the street urchins would come and pick him up again and push him so that they could hurt him more. Now this was done, why? He didn't have any sins. He was already beloved in the eyes of Allah. Why was this done? Why was this sacrifice made? Why did he go through this difficulty? You know, you and I don't go through this for our own children. We don't go through this for our own wife. We've never skipped a meal for our own family members. We can't. We've never stood the whole night in tahajjud just for the sake of our children. Have you ever heard of anybody? For the sake of their own children, the whole night they stood in tahajjud. Maybe one hour, two hours, but the whole night, the Prophet sallallahu did it every night for you and I. Why did he go three miles of being pelted with stones, blood from head to toe, and when the angels come and say, look, it's in our power and control, we can crush these people, and he says, no, don't crush them. Why I have hope that from their progeny, they might not accept Islam, but somebody from their children and offspring will expect, accept Islam. Now do you know that today you and I are sitting here because of that Ta'if day, because of that blessed blood of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam which he shed for you? He shed for you. He shed for you and me. Why? Because from the progeny of the people of Ta'if and the Saqib, a youngster by the name of Muhammad bin Qatim, he accepted Islam, and he is the one who brought Islam to the Indian subcontinent, to our, to our lands, because of which you, you and I are sitting here today. So you and my Prophet, putting aside all the other sacrifices, and all the other hunger, and the difficulty, and the torture he went through, just think of the time in Ta'if. Think of the time in Ta'if. Take out some time. Sit down yourself. Think. The most beloved of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, I can make the Mount of Safa out of gold and I'll follow you. He didn't choose this. He chose to strive. And not only in the dunya, even in the akhirah, he says, if you don't find me by the bridge of Sirat, try and look for me by the scales. And if any one of my ummati comes and his good deeds are left, I will try and push down his scales. You don't find me there, find me by the bridge of Sirat. I will ensure that none of my ummah will fall into the fire of Jahannam. You don't find me there, find me by the arsh of Allah. I will pledge to him I have been prostration, making sure every one of you are safe from the fire of Jahannam. That Nabi who cried for me, that Nabi who shed tears for me, that Nabi who bled for me, that Nabi who sacrificed his entire life, his children went hungry. Days on end, he didn't think about his own children. Fatima radiallahu anha, a time came, her stomach was nearly touching her back. This is how skinny she became. Why? She hasn't eaten for days on end. And today, we cannot read Duru Sharif upon that same Nabi five times a day, ten times a day, twenty times a day. We can't think of him, we can't remember him, we have not taken out time for him. So this is a great deficiency insha'Allah, from today onwards we will try and fulfill this great obligation upon us. So Durud Sharif is very very important, we need to make a daily practice, a daily practice of reciting Durud Sharif as much as we can. It is very 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 beneficial. You read one Durud Sharif, Allah will shower you with ten of his mercy, ten of your sins are forgiven. And you can read any Durud Sharif, the long one you read in Salah, you can read that one. You can read a small one, Sallallahu Ala Nabi Ummi. Everybody knows this now, it's very very easy, we've discussed it many times before. Sallallahu Ala Nabi Ummi. Sallallahu Ala Nabi Ummi. I'll tell you another one. Very beneficial, and this is also very short, but it's complete Durud Sharif. 
Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Nabi Al-Ummi, yes, has the words of Salat in there, of salutation. But we don't have the words of peace and sending salutation upon his family, mem- family members. So we have a complete, shortest, complete Durul Sharif. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sallim. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sallim. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. We have the words of Salat in there, Salam in there, and alihi, his family members as well. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sallim. Again, this is from Hadith. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sallim. Now, how long will it take? Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sallim. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sallim. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sallim. You can read this so many times. In one breath, you can read it five times. If we develop a habit, Okay, within moments we can read it thousand times, two thousand times, three thousand times, why not? In the hadith of Tabrani we find the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentions whoever recites Durud Sharif one thousand times every day, you will not die until Allah shows you your talat in Jannah. This is in Tabrani. And alhamdulillah we have many people in the last week or so in our madrasa we kept a composition in the children. Being the month of Rabi Ul Awwal, they've been trying to learn these 20 lessons as well. And we kept the competition, who can recite the most Durud Sharif? And these are the things we should be competing in. We're competing other things. These are the things we need to compete in. So the children became very excited. They got this tasbih, you know, the electronic tasbih we have on the counters. And alhamdulillah, amazingly, amazingly, you know, we had young, young children, the age of 5, 6, 7, reciting 3,000 Durud Sharif every day throughout the week. 4,000 Durud Sharif, 5,000 Durud Sharif. Over the weekend, three of these young children got together, they recited 81,000 Durud Sharif. Within moments. And this is no fairy tale, I've verified this with their parents. And it's, when somebody wants to do it, it's very, very easy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it easy for you, it's possible. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us this ability, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us this connection with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad ibn Sa'id ibn Mutarrib, as Shaykh Rahmatullah mentioned in Fazal al-Durud, was a person, he says, that I had fixed an amount of durood every single day before I used to go to bed, I fixed that I'm going to read X amount of time, whether it was 100 or 1000 or 200 or 300, and you can do it any time, walking around sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, all the time you, you keep yourself busy in this durood sharif, all the time, you will see the benefits, your life will change, you will be a different person altogether. So he says, I fixed a particular amount of durood every single day, and he says that one night I was on my balcony and I read my durood and I went to sleep. That night, he says, I saw Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in my dream. And the hadith of Sahih Bukhari, Man ra'ani fil manam, faqad ra'ani, fa inna shaytan la yatamathnalu bi. Whoever sees me in his dream has definitely seen him because shaytan cannot resemble me. Authentic narration. She says, I saw him in my dream and he entered into our house. And the whole house became illuminated, full of noor. And then he approached me and he says, Oh Muhammad ibn Mutarrif, Come to me, give me your blessings, give me your lips. I want to kiss those lips with which you recite durood upon me every day. In a fixed number. He said, I became embarrassed. And I thought, how can I place my lips before Rasulullah? So I placed my cheek. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kissed me on my cheek and he went away. And he says, from that moment, the whole house became radiant and full of fragrance. My wife woke up because of the fragrance. And she says, what is this fragrance? And I related the incident, and he says, for eight days, wherever I went, this fragrance remained with me. So we will see and benefit, inshallah, if we try and read as much durood as possible. Everyone will try, inshallah, let's make some tashkil. Who's going to make intention, inshallah? I'm serious, I'm serious here. It's not just inshallah, I'm, I'm, I'm serious. Who's making a genuine intention, inshallah, that every day I'm going to try and read 1,000 durood sharif. 1,000 durood sharif. Yeah, think before you say it. Think before you say it. And if you're ready, inshallah, put your hand up. And let's, let's join, let's, let's start this mission up together, inshallah. 1,000 Guru Sharif every day, inshallah. Who else is thinking, inshallah? We can do it, it's easy, it's not difficult. Wherever we are going, sallallahu ala nabi ummi, sallallahu ala nabi ummi, sallallahu ala nabi ummi, sallallahu ala And many people have done it. Many people have done it. A few years ago, a brother came to me. He said, I was once uh, a musbuk. I missed some rakat. 
It's strange how sometimes these things happen. He says, I missed my rakat, I was completing my salah, and he says, you were mentioning this fadila of reciting 1,000 Duru Sharif every day, and I overheard. So I was finishing my salah, and I heard this, I was walking out. Whilst walking out of the masjid, I, it just fell in my ear. So he says, I thought to myself, let me stop practicing. So he says, for such an amount of time, I've been doing this every day. He says, this weekend, it's my daughter's wedding. And I know I'll be very, very busy. So is it okay if I read 500 in the morning, 500 in the evening? So like this we find, you know, there's, not, there's no harm in this. You can read as many as you want. So he used to do it in one sitting, try and finish it up every single day. So like this, Alhamdulillah, there are many, many, many people who are reading. And Hazrat Muhammad Al-Hasa, the son of Hazrat Shaykh Rahmatullah, when he comes, he says that every Muslim should try and read at least 5,000 Guru Sharif. But we've made it very easy, given you a discount, 1,000 insha'Allah, we can all do this together insha'Allah. We will do this? Okay. Um, number three. So the first thing we said, we study the seerah. Number two, we said recitation of durur in abundance. We will try and do this insha'Allah. If 1,000 every day, very, very good. Alhamdulillah. Number three is very important. Something we've been trying to mention again and again is ponder and reflect upon the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. My chef, he says, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a great treasure, which is the mind. At the moment, even now, you might be listening to me, your mind might be wandering somewhere. And our mind, how, how much does it cost to use your mind? When we have to read the root, it, it, there is some sort of effort we have to exert. We have to say the word, sallallahu alayhi wa nabi al-ummi. It does, you know, take some kind of an effort. But to think, there's no effort whatsoever. For free of charge. We can become so close to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if all the time we can keep our mind occupied with the thoughts of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, whenever you see a six year old child, why don't we think of the incident of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he was six years old and he saw his own mother pass away? You will see a difference in your life. When you hear the adhan, you're sitting in the masjid, you'll hear the adhan now. Yes, you might be doing something, you might be doing wudu, you might be walking up the stairs, but our minds should become occupied. Imagine, how was it when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would be in the masjid, and the muazzin would say, Ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah Imagine the kafi of the sahaba. When we stand for salah, for example, think about how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam performed his salah. When you make salam with somebody, yes, you're looking at that person. Take your mind to how did he make salam. You sit in your car, think how he rode on the camel, on the donkey, on the horse. When you walk, think about how he walked. When you are eating, think about the eating of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Connect ourselves. All the time, all the time, all the time, occupy ourselves with the thought. We can only do this when we read the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Um, we can, this will really benefit us. You know a person once came to a sheikh. And he said, I want you to teach me, how can I see Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in my dream? Who wants to do this? Who wants this? I'll tell you the secret as well. I'll share it with you. I think nobody wants to know. Okay, let's move on. Let's move on to the next one. Okay, number four. Nobody wants to see the Prophet ﷺ in the dream. Oh, we do. Okay. It's a delayed response. I think you are thinking about it. No, I'm not going to charge you, don't worry. Is that probably what you were thinking? No, there's no cost to it whatsoever. There's no charge. Okay. The only condition is that we have to do what we are told, inshallah. We'll do this. The sheikh, the sheikh, he said to the murid, he said to the students, you want to see Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in your dream? He says, yes. He goes, okay, I'll teach you. I promise I will teach you. But you have to stay the night at my house. I'm not calling you to my house. <laughs> so he says, come at this certain time. So he comes. The student comes. And the sheikh says, yes, the meal is ready. The food is ready. Sit down. So he thinks he's honored and privileged to eat with the sheikh. So the food is prepared. The sheikh has made food. It's very salty. The saltiest food ever. He puts the whole bottle of salt in there and he puts no water so the student is eating he finds it salty obviously but he finds it disrespectful to say can I ask him? he thinks it's a, it's a privilege for me to eat here so I shouldn't really ask for anything else uh, I don't want to be disrespectful so he continues to eat and now at the end of the meal he's very very thirsty his throat is full of salt but then the sheikh says this is the room where you'll be staying and sleeping uh, you, you go to rest here I'm going to rest now so the student goes and he takes some rest he spends the night, in the morning the sheikh wakes up, the student wakes up, he says to him, so did you see Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in your dream? He says, no I didn't, I thought you were going to teach me, I thought I'll see him tonight, but nothing happened. 
I didn't see the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in my dream. So did you see anything? He said, yeah, I did have a dream, but it was not about Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And I came to learn about seeing Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the dream. He says, okay, what did you see? Did you see a dream? He said, yes. What did you see in the dream? He said, well, I saw rivers, and I saw streams, and I saw fountains, and I saw streams of water, and I saw seas, and I saw oceans, and I saw lots and lots of rain. He says, so you saw lots of water. He goes, yes, I did. He goes, do you know why this is? Because why? Because when you went to sleep, you were thinking about water. So that's why you saw lots and lots of water. If you go to sleep thinking about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you will see Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Very, very simple. Today we don't think about him. You and I know, I don't need to mention. And we might be disrespectful to mention what goes through our minds. Uh, so this is... The key. Let us connect ourselves to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And inshallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless us. And finally, most importantly, we need to implement his sunnah. Obedience to the messenger and true love is that we try and implement his sunnah. Walk his walk, talk his talk. Man ahabba sunnati faqad ahabbani. Wa man ahabbani kaala ma'iya fil jannah. Whoever loves my sunnah, he has loved me. And whoever loves me, he will be with me in paradise. Let us try and develop on a daily basis, on a weekly basis more and more sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam I pray to Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he grants us true love of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam may Allah wake us up from our sleep and give us the realization of this neglected obligation and faraq which today we have neglected totally may Allah give us the understanding and the true love of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam may he help us to recite abundant uh, durush sharif on a daily basis those of us who have made intention may Allah accept our intention and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the life of the sunnah wa aqlu da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alayhi